23, 23 through 38. I, um, I preached one time on the genealogy in Matthew, but I've never pre preached on the genealogy in Luke. And I'm only going to make one point from this genealogy, so don't get scared that each name is a point in the message. <laughs> um, this is, again, this is the thought that came to me this week. Um, and uh, and, and um, I feel it's important. I'm going to talk to parents this morning, and then I'm going to talk to children about their parents, or young people about their parents. And uh, I just, and it's irrelevant to everyone, because every single one of us, even if we didn't have children, um, we were children, <laughs> and we're adults now, and we all have an opinion or a perspective on our upbringing, on how our parents raised us, or whatever. And uh, there's just a, a, an important principle in this passage that we can learn from that will help us. If you're a parent, this will help you. If you, are, if you have parents and you're still in their home, this will help you. Um, and if you just have a, a childhood or a past and you struggle to understand how that affects your life today, this will also help you. Um, and uh, so uh, it's uh, Luke chapter 3, verses 23 through 38. Luke chapter 3, verses 23 through 38. There's a lot of names here. Um, what I want you to understand about this passage is this passage is saying that you can start with Jesus and you can go back name by name all the way back to Adam. That's how we know the age of the earth. You can figure that out just from this. Jesus said in the beginning of creation, he made the male and female. So this goes back to the beginning of creation. Man was created on the sixth day. Um, and so this is important. Um, these were all real people. These are not just names somebody made up. These are all real people. They go all the way back to the beginning of creation. Um, and uh, it's important that we understand when we read the Bible, the Bible is real history. These are real names, real genealogy, real people who really lived. Um, and uh, we know where Jesus came from. And so th this is important for history, but there's a spiritual application of this as well. And uh, so I'm going to start reading in verse 23, Luke uh, chapter 3, uh, verses 23 to the end of the chapter. And Jesus himself began to be about 30 years of age, being, as was supposed, the son of Joseph. Now you understand why it says that. Joseph was not Jesus' biological father. The Holy Spirit, Jesus was conceived by the Holy Spirit. God was um, his father. Um, but uh, he was supposed to be Joseph's father because Joseph married his mother. And so most people assume Joseph was his father. Um, but Joseph was still his father that raised him, right? So he was raised by Joseph. So how would you like to have the job of raising the son of God? <laughs> Oof, I'm glad Joseph had to do that, not me. So, <laughs> um, so it says, it as was supposed the son of Joseph, okay? And then we'll just keep going. Which was the son of Heli, which was the son of Matthat, which was the son of Levi, which was the son of Melchi, which was the son of Jana, which was the son of Joseph, which was the son of Mattathias, which was the son of Amos, which is the son of Nahum, which is the son of Esli, which is the son of Nagi, which was the son of Maath, which was the son of Mattathias, which was the son of Semei, which was the son of Joseph, which was the son of Judah, which was the son of Joanna, which was the son of Risa, which was the son of Zerubbabel, which was the son of Salathiel, which is the son of Neri, which is the son of Melchi, which was the son of Adai, which is the son of Kosam, which was the son of Elmodam, which is the son of Ur, which is the son of Josi, which was the son of Eliezer, which was the son of Joram, which was the son of Matthat, which was the son of Levi, which was the son of Simeon, which was the son of Judah, which was the son of Joseph, which was the son of Jonan, which was the son of Eliakim, which was the son of Melia, which was the son of Menan, which was the son of Mattatha, which was the son of Nathan, which was the son of David, which was the son of Jesse, which was the son of Obed, which was the son of Boaz, which was the son of Salmon, which was the son of Naasson, which was the son of Amminadab, which was the son of Aram, which was the son of Esram, which was the son of Perez, which was the son of Judah, which was the son of Jacob, which was the son of Isaac, which was the son of Abraham, which was the son of Pharaoh, which was the son of Nacor, which was the son of Serek, which was the son of Regal, which was the son of Phalek, which was the son of Heber, 
which is the son of Sela, which is the son of Kainan, which is the son of Arphaxad, which is the son of Shem, which is the son of Noe, uh, which is the son of Lamech, which was the son of Methuselah, which was the son of Enoch, which is the son of Jared, which was the son of Ma 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 Maliel, which was the son of Kainan, which was the son of Enos, which was the son of Seth, which was the son of Adam, which was the son of God. Um, now for you, uh, uh, Lucas, capítulo 3, uh, versos uh, 23 al 38. Just so want to be sure that he knew what we're reading. <laughs> so, okay, so that's... Uh, now, uh, one thing you'll notice that some of the names are like, wait a minute, that, that doesn't sound right. It, that's, that's not the way those names sounded in the Old Testament. That's because the New Testament is written in Greek. Greek does not have the same sounds that Hebrew has, so some of the, the names in here are pronounced or written differently than Old Testament names. And you can probably figure out who, which one that says Noe is Noah, but um, they didn't have an H in Greek, so it says Noe is how they would say it, or Noe is how they would say it. So, um, um, so some of those like that. Um, you'll see that the spelling's different, you kind of figure out who it is. So I'm just letting you know why the spelling's different is because the Old Testament's written in Hebrew, the New Testament's written in Greek, and so they transliterated the sounds um, into Greek, and not all the sounds transliterate, right? So the, word, the, 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 the names sound a little different in the New Testament than the Old, that's why. But uh, here's what I want you to see. I want you to see that it says that Jesus was the son of Joseph. Now I know that that means he was, as was supposed, so Joseph raised him. Joseph was Jesus' parent. Okay, that's the first thing I want you to see in this passage. But now as you go through, and it's kind of repetitious, son of the son of the son of the son, right? Are all those people parents? By definition, right? Son of son of son of all those those are all parents. So Joseph was Jesus' parent. Am I right? And as you go through, it's the parent, the parent, the parent, son of the son of the son means the, the, the person who was their parent. We agree that Joseph was Jesus' parent because he raised him. We agree that each name after that was the parent. That's a parent. <laughs> Does a dad joke become funny when it's a parent, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> and so it's apparent that this passage is about parents. Am I right? Yeah. Yes, that's apparent. Okay, so you go all the way through. And you kind of get the point after a while that these people were all parents when you hear over and over again, son of the son of the son. But then you get to Adam. And in your mind, something changed. In the text, nothing changed. But in your mind and in my mind, when we get to Adam, we don't think parent when we get to God. Even though it says the same thing, which was the son of God, we go, yeah, Adam was created from the dust of the earth by God because we know the story. In your mind and in my mind, we change the meaning at that stage. I'm not saying it's right or wrong. I'm just saying that's how we are as humans. We read it because we know the story about Adam and Eve. And we often do this, by the way. Our brains actually have autocorrect. You know how phones nowadays have autocorrect? And don't you hate it when it autocorrects something really bad sometimes? <laughs> no! It already said. <laughs> then, you, then you put a little asterisk. I meant this word, right? <laughs> <laughs> it's scary. You gotta watch out for that autocorrect. Sometimes it'll autocorrect something really bad, you know. Okay, okay. So, do you know that your brains are computers? Your brain is a computer, and your brain autocorrects all the time. Somebody says something, and you autocorrect to what you think they meant. Isn't that true? We all do that. Oh, that tone of voice, the, the look on their face, especially maybe if you're teenage, rolling your eyes, whatever. Right? There's something you're like autocorrect, and you're. You're correcting what you heard, what you said, what you read. You're autocorrecting. We all do it. Read the Bible. We autocorrect. One of the very important keys to understanding the Bible is to learn how to, to detect your own autocorrect. Learn how to know when you're actually thinking something different than what it says. So here's what I want you to very clearly correct in your mind. I want you to interrupt your auto. I want to turn off your autocorrect right now. It's in your own brain. Just turn it off. You go into settings. <laughs> Find the autocorrect setting. Turn it off. The suggested. Um, take, take all that off. And I want you to just look at this passage. Get rid of the autocorrect. That's what we're doing in, th in Sunday school with Revelation. Your brain's on autocorrect. It's like such and such movie I watched, book I read, so and so said. And we don't stop and realize, when did we get that idea? Well, it's not in the Bible. It's somebody said it and we got it. 
and now we're getting the suggested or the autocorrect. Okay, turn off the autocorrect setting in your brain. And go back and look at the passage and say, wait a minute, Joseph raised Jesus. So Joseph is Jesus' parent. And then, boom, 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 all the way through, son of, son of, son of, these are all parents, these are all parents, these are all parents. And then when you get to the last one, instead of autocorrecting and going, and then God created man in his own image. In image God created him. Man of him created them. And he made a plant in the garden. And God formed out of the dust of the ground. I'm not saying that's, it's true, it's exactly what happened. But I want you to see that the Holy Spirit is telling us in this passage that God was Adam's parent. Because it's, all in there, the same way, all the way through. So God was Adam's parent. And that's the title of the message. The perfect parent. The perfect parent. Adam was the son of God. So God was his parent. Now I know, Adam, I mean, God kind of skipped the hard part, didn't he? Nobody had to get pregnant for nine months. <laughs> Nobody had to give birth. <laughs> Nobody had to have di be in diapers. Nobody had to go through any of the stages, right? Nobody had to stay up all night with or anything like he just boom, he's an adult, right? I mean I mean God kind of did it the easy way, I get it. But he is still called Adam's parent. I mean, who else was there to be Adam's parent? There was nobody else there except God, right? And then I know he took a rib, and there's all meaning in that. We talk about that as preachers when we talk about marriage. Why God didn't make Eve from the dust of the ground? He took part of Adam. That's the missing part. Bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. There's a meaning in all that. But yet, but yet God created Eve. So Eve became God's child as well. Eve became a parent. But they were fully grown. I get that they were fully formed, but the Bible still says God was the parent. So think of it as instant perfection. I mean, wouldn't you love that? <laughs> wouldn't you love it if you could go, you could go on a computer program or something and hit click? And that 3D printer would print a full-grown child, and this is my kid. Look at that. Looks just like me. I changed the eyebrows a little bit because I didn't like that. I made them a little taller because I'm kind of short. And wouldn't you love it if you could create? I mean, that's kind of what cloning is a little bit, you know? I mean, if you've ever read um, Brave New World, you know? That's a book about people being created in artificial wounds in the, in the distant future and all that. But either way, if you could just go click and just like run a computer program or give a command and boom, and you have this fully formed adult, mature adult, hey, listen, 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 without a sin nature. Wow. Adam had no sin nature. Like, that would be pretty amazing. You know, and he looks like God, created in, his, he let us make man our own image. You know? And then he's like, okay, that's, everything's perfect, something's not quite right, we make a female. So Eve is perfect too, no sin nature, right? I mean, that's pretty amazing. That's what God did. No one else gets to do that, but God can do anything he wants. And that's what he did. He created a fully formed, perfect adult. And he was the perfect parent. I mean, by definition, God is a perfect parent. He cannot lie, the Bible says. He can't sin. He can't lie. He can't do anything wrong. Okay. So if God creates a man and a woman and puts them in a garden, and I pre I'm preaching a series at the nursing home right now called... Uh, the peace of God. And, and the first message of that series is the place of perfect peace. So talking about going all through the Bible, talking about the peace of God. How do you get the peace of God? And how do you keep the peace of God? And, and why, how the peace of God relates to everything in the Bible. And that first message was the place of perfect peace. Because think about the Garden of Eden. It was the place of perfect peace. Now we know at the end of the Bible, we go back to the place of perfect peace, right? There's the tree of life, and there's the new Jerusalem, and it's a place of perfect peace, okay? And there's a lot of nasty stuff in between, isn't there? Right, okay. So, God created something perfect. But God is, according to this passage, God was Adam's parent. Now, he's Eve's parent, too. It's not mentioned here, but he was their parent. So, God was, by definition, God's the perfect parent. Right? I mean, that's not even something, I don't have to prove that to you. By definition, God's perfect. He's holy, he's righteous, he's just, he doesn't sin, he doesn't do anything wrong. He does everything perfect. God saw everything he made, he hold it was very good. God's the perfect parent. I use the word perfect on purpose, right? Because <laughs> that's the thing where it's like, oh, I'm not perfect. We're not perfect, right? Oh, I wish I could be perfect. I don't know how to be perfect. You won't be. Forget it. Don't try, <laughs> right? But God was a perfect parent. So what are we going to learn from this? Well, let's go to Genesis chapter 2. And we're going to learn some things about the perfect parent. We're going to learn something from God. 
And after this message, you'll be able to go home and be a perfect parent. I'm kidding. That's a joke. <laughs> oh, man. Pastor, why did you wait nine years to tell me? <laughs> I could have really used to my kids for a little. <laughs> Tell me how to be a perfect parent now. <laughs> After I messed everything up. You know? <laughs> Trust me, if I knew how, I would have tried. To, I would have done it myself. So, um, so, um, so no, no. We're we're talking about what God did, so that we can correct our wrong idea about parenting. All right, that's what we're doing here. We're learning from the perfect parent. You're not the perfect parent. I'm not the perfect parent. You didn't have perfect parents. I didn't have perfect parents. But we can learn something from a perfect parent, can't we? I mean, if God was perfect and we're supposed to be like him, we're not going to be perfect like him. But we can learn something from what God did, right? I mean, why in the world would you take someone who did everything perfect and go, well, they're not the, they're not the standard. Let's not use them. Well, of course, you always learn from the best. Even if you're only a cheap imitation of the best, you always learn from the best, right? You wouldn't pick somebody who was a bad parent and learn from them. You're going to learn from the best parent you can. And God's the best parent by definition. Nobody's like, what's Pastor looking for? I can't not find my uh, watch. <laughs> now you're in trouble. What? I thought you put it on the stove. I, I thought I did too. You know, maybe it fell or something. Right on the speaker? Right oh, yeah, you're right. Thank you. Perfect. All right. It's good for me to know what time it is. It doesn't seem like you know what time it is, Pastor. Well, you don't want to know what happens if I don't know what time it is. So. <laughs> Okay, okay, so we're going to learn something about the perfect parent. You ready? So here we go. Um, at Genesis chapter 2, verses um, 8 and 9. Genesis chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. Uh, Genesis capítulo 2, versos 8 y 9. Sí, okay. And the Lord God planted the garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed. And out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food, the tree of life also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. I mean, look at that. Number one, the perfect parent prepares the perfect environment. All right? I mean, that's logical. Think about it. If you're a parent, you want to have the best possible environment for your child. Am I right? I mean, that's just natural. It's in you. There would be something wrong if you're like, no, my kids are growing in a bad environment. Of course you want to have the best possible environment. Now, we have to be careful because at this stage, someone's going to think, well, it's good for kids to grow up in the rough, difficult world because they can build character that way. That's true, but that's after sin, right? That's after sin came into the world that God said, there's going to be problems that will build your character. Right now, though, there's no sin in the world. So when you think about it, there's no reason for God to put anything negative or unpleasant in that garden, right? Because there's no sin in the world. There's no need for anything unpleasant. In heaven, God, Jesus isn't going to go, well, you know, just for your character, because you need to, like, be thankful, we're going to have bad things happen here once in a while. <laughs> so you can remember how it used to be on the earth, so you're grateful. No, 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 no. It's all going to be perfect in heaven, and there's nothing negative, no sin, no suffering. Do you understand? Like, we got to get that clear in our minds. Even though we say it's good for you to grow and mature and go through hard knocks and suffering and difficulty, that's true because of our sin nature, it's good for us. But in reality, God never intended for there to be any suffering or death or negative or pain or anything like that. You understand that? So we had that in the past. We lost that, and then we're going to get it again. We lost paradise. We're going to regain paradise. Yes. Okay, I just want to clarify that so you get that. Okay, because our minds are, well, well, why did God put them in a perfect place? Didn't they need to, like, suffer a little? No, not then. They didn't. Okay. The perfect parent prepares a perfect environment, and it's true. Now, you can't do that, but you will prepare as best as you can the best environment you can for your kid, that you can afford, that you are able to create, right? I mean, that's just normal. Any any normal parent's going to do that. I get some people grew up in bad homes and parents maybe were non-existent, not there. But the vast majority of parents, even if they don't know what they're doing, even if they make bad decisions, their intention, their desire, their goal is to have a good environment for their kids, right? I mean, if you could afford a really good school, you're not going to put your kids in a bad school, am I right? <laughs> I mean, just think about it. If you can afford a, a, a nicer house, you're not going to put your kids in an inferior house. You know, If you can afford a better car, you're not going to put them in an inferior car. Right? Am I right? You're just It's natural as a parent. You want the best for your kids. Whatever you can afford, whatever you can do, 
whatever you're able. You're going to try to be a good parent. That's just in you. That comes, from, that's, that comes from God, that you love your kids and you want what's best for them. But listen, the perfect parent prepares a perfect environment. So Jesus, God, created a perfect environment. Adam, look, he says he created this beautiful garden. Uh, okay, and he, and he put them in that garden. Okay, so the perfect parent prepares a perfect environment. Now, we could look at that tree of knowledge of good and evil and go, was that perfect? Well, God saw everything and maybe said it was very good. So evidently, that tree needed to be there. People have speculated for thousands of years, why did God put the tree of knowledge of good and evil in the garden? And I think the best answer is, you know, people, we can all argue about that God doesn't tell us why, he just put it there. It's like your problem figured out. <laughs> but I think you can really say God wants us to choose. And when you have that tree of knowledge of good and evil, they had to make a choice, were they going to obey God, follow him or not? It was a free choice. God values free will and choice, and he wants that. So, you know, Adrian Rogers said this, I've said this many times, he said, why doesn't God destroy evil? If God destroyed evil, God would destroy choice. If God destroys choice, God would destroy love. If God destroyed love, God would destroy the highest good. So if God destroyed evil, God would be destroying the highest good. I don't make sense to me, you know? I've had people argue with me, but like, oh, I'm like, well, let's go argue with Adrian Rogers. He's dead, you can't argue with him, but... I just quoted him, so. But I think that's a good explanation. That's his, his own words, but it's a good explanation. So the perfect parent prepares the perfect environment. That's number one. That's just normal. You're going to try to have that. God had a perfect environment. But now I want you to see something. God actually did create the perfect environment. But did that guarantee a perfect outcome? No, it didn't. But he did do that. So that's the part I want you to understand in this message. Okay, that's number one. Number two, the perfect parent gives perfect instructions. The perfect parent gives perfect instructions. When you think about it, and you have a kid, and you have a hot stove, you're not just like, well, they'll find out when they bump into it that they're going to burn themselves. No, you're going to say, don't touch the hot stove. Now, you may sometimes allow, you know, I've heard people doing this. I've actually done this with my children. You have a, you heat the, the, when we had a wood stove, you heat the wood stove to where it's hot enough that it hurts, but not as hot enough that it will burn you. Just barely, the very beginning of the wood stove. And then you say, hot and they touch it, and they don't get burned, but they feel a little pain, and then you say, hot. They touch it again, you say, hot. And they learn the word hot, what it means. You're not hurting the kid, because it's not hot enough to burn them, but it, it does hurt a little bit, and they go, ooh, and then they like rub their little stubby fingers. And then after that, they always give a wide berth, right? So, um, and so uh, that's you giving your kids instructions, right? When they're little. Huh? Now, God didn't have to say, I don't need hot, hot, you know, because they were grown. He said, don't eat it. I'll give you get it, because... They had, they had adult brains. But uh, you get what I'm saying. You will give your kids instruction. Look both ways before the cross street. They're just going to have to learn someday. When they get run over, then they won't do it again. <laughs> no, you're going to give them perfect instructions, right? You're going to say, look both ways before you cross street, right? Am I right? Like a perfect parent gives perfect instructions. And God did that. He gave them perfect instructions. Look at verse 15 and 17. 15 and 17. The Lord God took the man, put him in the garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat. Hey, listen, remember the song I just sang? Fly away. Um, your creator made you free to choose your path. Is that in here? Of every tree in the garden thou mayest freely eat. God liked that, folks. Like, he really does give us freedom. There's a price to pay if you abuse that freedom. But he loves freedom. You know, God loves freedom more than I and you do. If we could, we would not allow our children to do certain things the rest of our life. If we could stop them, we would. I mean, if we, you know that we love our kids. We would follow them around everywhere. Oh, no. We would, we would hire a private investigator to watch them and then, like, jump in the way and pull them away just before they got hit by the train or whatever. We would do that. We would, you know, blow away that nasty boyfriend before he can... Because, you know, I'm, I'm just kidding, you know, but, it, but I mean, you know, guys are like that, right? So, uh, protect their daughters or whatever, right? Um, okay, I'm getting off track. So, what I'm saying is, the perfect parent gives perfect instructions. Freedom. He said, of every tree, that may freely eat. I'm finding my spot here. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. God gave them. They were adults. So he's not saying run out in the street and you get hit and then you won't do it again. Will you? He wasn't saying that. They were adults. They could understand it. They had a choice not to do it. With children, little children, you don't do that because they can't comprehend. So you learn how to protect them and you know cover up wall outlets and things like that. right? But um, the perfect parent gives perfect instructions. So you would do that. You would give your kids the best instructions you know how to prepare them for life. Hey, these are just basic things. These are normal. But God did it with them. 
And we try. We do it imperfectly. There's always an instruction we forget. Oh, I forgot to tell them not to do that, right? <laughs> We're not perfect parents. But the perfect parent God is the standard here, and here's what he did. He created a perfect environment, and he gave them perfect instructions. That's what a perfect parent does. Okay, and then number three. It's in Genesis 3, 9 through 11. Genesis capítulo 3, versos no, no, um, 9 al 11. No, yes, al 11. No, yes. Okay. Sorry, my brain doesn't do as good as Google Translate. Okay, um, and here's the third point. The perfect parent gives perfect freedom to their adult children. How do I know this? Because it's in the passage. Look at this. Uh, Genesis 3, 9 through 11. Here's God talking to Adam. And the Lord God called unto Adam. This is after they sinned. Okay. And the Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid, because I was naked, and I hid myself. And he said, Who told thee that thou wast naked? Hast thou eaten of the tree whereof I commanded thee that thou shouldest not eat? Did you eat the tree I told you not to eat? Notice what he didn't say. Oh, man, I forgot that tree was there. Oh, I forgot to warn you about that tree. Oh, uh, why did I even put that tree in the garden? That was crazy. I wasn't even thinking. Oh, man, what a mess. Now, what am I going to do now? You notice what he said? He said, did you eat the tree I told you not to eat? <laughs> like, Bill Cosby, you said, fortune not, fortune not, fortune drink your drink. <laughs> he asked him, did you eat the tree I told you not to eat? What does that mean? That means the perfect parent gives perfect freedom to their adult children. They were adults. Adam and Eve were adults. I get it. He got to fast forward. He's an instant in, instant human. You know, he, he mixed up the instant human mix. And boom, they were adults. It wasn't this, this gradual growing and maturing, right? He, they were instant. They were, they were grown. <laughs> but listen, you know, it's like 3D printer. <laughs> Create a human or whatever. But you know what happened is they were adults and he gave them freedom. He said, here's everything. And then there's that one tree. Don't eat it. Bye. He left. <laughs> I always say that, you know, like, this is why you got to read through the Bible. Years ago, I was reading the Bible, and I got to chapter 2, and I was like, God, what were you thinking? Oh, he's a lot smarter than me. And this is my paraphrase. Adam. Yes, sir. Name all the animals, okay? All right. But then he goes... I naming animals afterwards. He, he, see this garden? Beautiful. I created you. You're smart. You're intelligent. You're, you're perfect in every way. And here's the garden I made for you. Okay, yep. Yeah. Good. Sounds good. God, everything's great. Okay, just one command. Just a little instruction. All those trees, you can eat from all of them. Probably thousands of trees. Who knows? That tree, don't touch. And then he walked away. God, are you crazy? What are you doing? God literally said, don't eat that tree, and he walked away. Because Adam was an adult. You won't do that with your five-year-old. See that gun? Don't pick it up, don't pull the trigger, and then just leave it walk away. No, no, you're not going to do that. See that, uh, see that hand grenade? Don't pull the pin to your five-year-old. No. Um, put them next to a cliff with some toys and Legos and stuff. See that, see that cliff over there? No, don't go there. You'll fall. It'll, it'll be an owie. <laughs> and then just walk away. You would never do that with a five-year-old. Uh, but do you have to do that when they're grown? Yeah. Or you have to. You have to give them freedom when they're grown. Okay? When they're adults, you have to. I mean, I can't, I can't chase Aiden and Annie around and say, I can chase you two around. I'm just kidding. I can't chase Aiden around and like, watch out, there's a cliff over there. Follow Aiden with a drone everywhere he goes. <laughs> like, no, the loudspeaker like, slow down, you're breaking the speed limit. <laughs> Dad, quit harassing me. Get some gun to shoot down the road. <laughs> you know, if I'm rich, hire a private investigator. <laughs> Savannah, she goes, she gets up in the morning and she has her coffee or whatever. I don't think she's drinking coffee. She goes and she opens the window and she looks out and there's like a secret service agent. He like ducks behind a bush. <laughs> no, 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 no. I don't do that. I, I don't have any idea what Aiden's been. I don't have any idea what Annie or Annie, Annie are. Annie's doing. I, they have freedom. 
Hey, listen. God said to Adam, how did you know you're naked? Did you eat the tree and tell you not to eat? That's, the, that's your life with your adult children. I mean, I literally, I think sometimes, both, hey, nanny, did you go to that website I told you not to go to? <laughs> I'm not talking about like a bad website. I'm just like, information out there that's on the internet that I don't agree with. And they're like, yeah, I did, Dad, and I agree with them, not you. That's me. You know? That's all your kids. If your kid turns out, and I hope your kid turns out amazing, but you're still going to agree with everything they do. There's so many things you're like, I can't believe they did that. I can't believe I, I told them so many times. Because a perfect parent gives perfect freedom to their adult children. And that's God. Because Adam and Eve were adults. And he said, how'd you know you're naked? Did you eat the tree I told you not to eat? Okay, here's, here's God's consequence. There's a consequence. But they had freedom to choose, didn't they? Okay. Wow. Think about this. A perfect parent. We're trying to learn about parenting. Teenagers, yeah, young people, because some of you are younger than teenagers, right? You're going to you're going to learn the next thing. This was for the adults here, right? Perfect parent prepares a perfect. God's a perfect parent. You can't argue with God's parenting. He prepared a perfect environment. He gave perfect instructions, and he gave perfect freedom to his adult children. Am I right? That's the model. If God's not the model for parenting, mm -hmm. then we have none, right? I mean, God's the model. And that's what he did. Perfect environment, perfect instructions, perfect freedom. When they were when they were adults, okay? Don't go home when you're 14 years old and say, Pastor says a perfect parent gives perfect freedom to their 14-year-olds. I didn't say that. Perfect freedom to their adult children. Okay. Now, let's go to Luke chapter 2. This part is more for the young people. Because at this stage, the parents feel better. Because the parents say, well, if God gave freedom to his adult children and it wasn't God's fault that his adult children ate from the wrong tree, right? Think about it. Parents are like, poof, I'm off the hook, right? So at that stage, you know, at this stage, the parents are feeling pretty good, I think. I'm feeling pretty good. Hopefully you are too. But now, if you're a young person, you might be like, okay, I get this. So far, the sermon makes sense. I have total freedom. God is a perfect parent. I have a choice what I do. I'm not going to be stupid like Adam and Eve, so I'm going to be okay. But God had, was a perfect parent, and my parents are nothing anywhere near close to God. So what about me? Well, that's the next. That's the next one. Remember the beginning of the passage I read? Being as was supposed, the son of Joseph. Now, if you go all the way down, son of, son of, son of, and you get to Adam, son of God, does that mean God was Adam's parent? But if you go all the way back to the beginning and you go, the son of Joseph, does that mean Joseph was Jesus' parent? Yes. Yes. Was Jesus sinless and perfect? He had no sin nature. In fact, he was just like Adam. He had no sin nature, just like Adam. Oh, but did Jesus have perfect parents? No, he did not. Mary and Joseph had a sin nature. They were not perfect parents. In fact, we're going to see in this passage, they were definitely not perfect parents. We're going to see that they made some mistakes. In fact, they failed to do what God did. They didn't create the right environment for him. Okay? So let's go there. Uh, Luke chapter 2 and verse 40. Mary and Joseph raised Jesus so they were his parents, right? Now I understand that God was his spiritual father. I understand that Joseph wasn't his biological father. I get that. But they raised him. So the parenting applies, doesn't it? And in the passage, it's son of, son of, son of all the way to the end. It doesn't differentiate between the son of in between. And the son at the beginning, uh, at the beginning of creation, the son of Adam, son of God, and the son of Joseph, it doesn't differentiate between any of those. It calls them all parents. That's why I read that whole passage. So you would agree with me, the entire passage causes calls them all parents. And again, your brain wants to do autocorrect right now. My brain wants to autocorrect. So, oh, wait, wait, it's not the same thing. It's not the same thing because they were created fully formed. 
and uh, jo uh, Joseph was not his biological father. It's not the same thing. Okay, I understand all that. But in the passage I read, don't do autocorrect, are they all parents? Yes, they are all parents. The wording is identical. They're all parents. In the sense of this, in the sense of they're responsible for raising the kid. And I get it that God did the fast forward quick version. And so, and I get that. But either way, it doesn't matter. He was still responsible. He could have created Adam as a teenager and then had him He could have created Adam as a five-year-old. He could have created Adam as a baby. He could have done it any way he wanted. He created fully formed. And so he was still Adam's parent. And then he gave him freedom. Okay. So Luke chapter 2, verse 40. Uh, Lucas um, capítulo 2, verso, verso 40. Luke chapter 2, verse 40. And the child grew and waxed strong in spirit, filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. Now here's Jesus Christ, and he's perfect. He is perfect, right? Now he's the perfect son, not the perfect parent, the perfect son, okay? But we're talking right now about parenting. We're talking about imperfect parents. Do we agree that Mary and Joseph were imperfect parents? Yes. They were imperfect parents. Maybe you read it, and because you don't give a lot of detail, again, your brain's going to autocorrect. Don't put Mary and Joseph on a pedestal. I know the angel says, Hail thou that art highly favored, the Lord is with thee, blessed art thou among women. I know that Mary was a godly woman. I know that God chose her because she a godly woman. I know that. But she still was a sinner in need of a savior. And she wasn't perfect. And we're going to see in the passage, Mary and Joseph weren't perfect. Don't put Mary and Joseph on a book. I, you said Joseph being a just man, not willing to make her a public example, was minded to put her away privately. I know Joseph was godly. I know marriage was godly. Uh, marriage. Mary was godly. But listen, don't put them on a pedestal. If they didn't have a sin nature, they were so amazing. They were human like you and me. They failed. They were imperfect parents. Okay. And Jesus was perfect and sinless. He didn't give up his sinless nature like Adam did. Adam started out sinless, but became a sinner. Mary and Joseph raised Jesus, for they were his parents. They were his parents. Look at Jesus. He grew. He was strong in spirit. He was filled with wisdom. The grace of God was upon him. I look at verse 41. Now his parents went to Jerusalem every year at the feast of the Passover. And when he was 12 years old, they went up to Jerusalem after the custom of the feast. And when they had fulfilled the days, as they returned, the child Jesus tarried behind in Jerusalem, and Joseph and his mother knew not of it. All right. Remember how God was the perfect parent? He created a perfect environment. Do you see here? Imperfect parents created an imperfect environment. They didn't know where their son was. They're on their way. Three days. Hey, listen, have you ever gone three days without knowing where your kids are? No. Whoa, I think we just blew the whole pedestal off of Mary and Joseph right here. I don't know any parents. Who would go for three days? Isn't that what it says? Yeah. Mm, they had the days of turn. Okay, then they saw them. Went, wait, wait, went on a day's journey after three days. Okay, they went three days, not where he was. But they went, okay, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm slandering Mary and Joseph. They went a whole day not knowing where he was. But you probably haven't done that. You know, unless you left them with someone you trusted, right? You said, okay. I'm going to leave the kid with you, you watch or whatever. But you wouldn't just be like, oh, he's around here somewhere. For 24 hours, you're traveling in this caravan going back to Nazareth. And for 24 hours, you don't know where he is? I'm not trying to say Mary and Joseph were bad. They probably trusted everybody in this caravan that they were traveling with. But it was a large enough group. They didn't know where he was, and they didn't think anything about the fact that they didn't know where he was, and they didn't realize they left in Jerusalem. Now, most people have left kids at some point somewhere. Well, boy, not for a whole day, not for 24 hours. I think it's very safe to say that there were these were imperfect parents and they created an imperfect environment. They weren't doing everything. They weren't creating the perfect environment for him. Now look at verses 44 through 49. But they, supposing him to have been in the company, went a day's journey, and they sought him among their kinsfolk and acquaintance. So they're going throughout. This must be a large care of people. All the relatives, oh, how about that group? Well, the Olsons, the Nelsons, the Johnsons. Huh, we checked with all of them, and none of them have seen Jesus. You know, he's always been a good kid up to this point. What happened? Where did we go wrong? <laughs> um, and when they found him not, they returned back again to Jerusalem, seeking him. And it came to pass that after three days, they found him in the temple, sitting in the midst of the doctors. These are doctors. The word doctor actually means a teacher, okay? both hearing them and asking them questions. 
And all that heard him were astonished at his understanding and answers. And when they saw him, they were amazed. And his mother said unto him, Son, why hast thou thus dealt with us? Behold, thy father and I have sought thee sorrowing. And he said unto them, How is it that ye sought me? Wist ye not that I must be about my father's business? Now, imperfect parents, number one in this section, imperfect parents created an imperfect environment. Number two, imperfect parents gave imperfect instructions. She's like, why'd you do this to us? Wait, he's in the temple. They were the ones that forgot where he was and didn't pay attention. He probably never knew they left. And once they left, they didn't have texting, cell phones, Google location. <laughs> they didn't have any of that. So when you think about it, he had no way to get a hold of them. They didn't check to see if he was with them when they left. Whose fault is this? Mary and Joseph's. It's not his fault. He's in the temple, and, he's, and then one day he's like, he probably, he probably walked around, looking around like, where's mom and dad? And oh, they already left. And he's like, he probably runs out to the, to the gate of the city of Jerusalem. He looks at he's like, where are they? And, and so I was like, oh, man, they left like hours ago. Like, you'll never catch up. And he's like, oh, well, I guess I'll go back to my father's house, my favorite place. And I'll just wait for him to come. And they'll come back and find me. If I stay in the temple, you know, the temple's a important place. They'll find me. Sorry, I was about to uh, sneeze there. Imperfect parents gave imperfect instructions. They are wandering, and after three days, they find him. They didn't go to the temple first. They didn't probably be like, oh, he's probably hanging around with that bad kid that we saw him talking to. You know what I'm trying to say? They thought the worst about him. He's the perfect son of God. They thought the worst about him. And they're wandering around looking all over, and they don't go to the temple until the third day. If they were a day's journey and a day back, if they were a whole day before they went to the temple. I mean, they could go straight to the temple. They were, and I'm not saying they were bad. I'm saying they were imperfect. Like, you got it? They were imperfect parents. Imperfect parents gave imperfect instructions. Do you see the contrast here? God is a perfect parent. He created a perfect environment. He gave perfect instructions. He gave perfect freedom. Adam sinned. But now here's Jesus. And now it's the parents' job to go, oh, well, I wish I had a perfect kid. Like Jesus, right? <laughs> the other one is the parents of the kids. Like, oh, I wish I had a perfect parent like, like God because I never would have eaten that stupid fruit. So everyone, I think, would have been fine. You know? <laughs> I didn't have a sin nature, wouldn't eat the fruit. But now it's the parents' job to go, wow, if I had Jesus, I mean, I just just watch, just make sure you know where he is. That's all you got to do. It's not like you got to discipline him. He's sinless, right? Should be kind of easy. At, um, uh, Mary and Joseph, you had one job, right? <laughs> if you ever seen those jokes, you had one job. They had one job, just know where his their son was at all times. That was their job. I mean, he was perfect. They were imperfect. They created an imperfect environment. They gave imperfect instructions. Huh. This is interesting. In verse 15. They understood not the saying which he spake unto them. No, that didn't get it. You know, I always said he was a weird kid. You know, Joseph, I would say he took after your side of the family, but the angel told me that it was a virgin birth, so I can't say that, you know. And Joseph's like, well, you said it, not me, you know. <laughs> um, they gave, in verse instructions, they restricted the freedom of their perfect child. Look at this. And he went down with them, and he came to Nazareth, and he was subject unto them. Did Jesus, was he ever going to sin or do anything wrong? But he was subject to them. They were sinners. They were imperfect. They restricted his freedom. Imperfect parents restricted the freedom of their perfect child. But his mother kept all these sayings in her heart, and Jesus increased in wisdom and stature in favor with God and men. Here's the point. Adam had no sin nature, and he had a perfect parent. And what did he do? Sin. He blew it. Jesus had no sin nature, just like Adam. And he had imperfect parents. And what did he do? He turned out right. Now, I understand that doesn't fit exactly us, because we get imperfect parents, imperfect kids. Maybe that's why we should be a little bit more gentle and compassionate and patient with each other, since we're all imperfect, okay? But if you see this, doesn't this blow all of our stereotypes about parenting and raising kids? Because you got sinless... Sinless parent, sinless kid, kid disobeys. Perfect parent. Then you have imperfect parents, sinless kid, and this kid does right, even though he's raised by imperfect parents. Do you see the contrast? Do you see how all of our stereotypes about parenting in our wrong mind are wrong? 
they are wrong. I'm not saying to go out there and be an idiot parent. I already know you're going to try to be the best parent you know how to be. And I'm trying to give you tools as a pastor. And the Bible gives you tools. But listen. Do the best you can. But ultimately, when your kids grow up, they're going to make their own decisions. This is very clear here. God's a perfect parent. Adam does not turn out right. Uh, Mary and Joseph are imperfect parents. And Jesus Christ saves the world. So it is ultimately a decision that you make. Adam made a decision as an adult. Now listen, and so did Jesus. Jesus lived in Nazareth till he was 30 years old. And then he went out to serve God. He made his own decisions, and it was his own decisions that determined the entire future of the human race. Adam had a perfect parent, and his bad decision as an adult destroyed the human race. Jesus was perfect. He had imperfect parents. His own decision as an adult saved the human race. Okay, Pastor, none of this really applies to us. Because both these people had no sin nature, and we all have sin nature. So how does this apply to us? I want you to know that the reason that Jesus saved the human race is not because he didn't have a sin nature. It was because he, as an adult, he surrendered his will to the Father. You know, Jesus was sinless and perfect, but he didn't save the world till he died on the cross. And did you know what Jesus had to do before he died on the cross? He had to surrender his own will. He said in Luke 22, 42, we won't look it up, I'll just read it to you. For the sake of time, Father, if thou be willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. You see, parents, how your children turn out, you are going to try to be the best parent you can be, but how your turn, children are going to turn out has nothing to do with if you're sinless or if they're sinless. That's a lost cause. <laughs> hey, young people, how you turn out has nothing to do with if your parents are sinless or you're sinless or if they're good parents or bad parents. That's not going to determine how you turn out. Did we prove that today? So you know it's going to determine how you turn out. And it's not that you're going to try hard not to sin and never mess up and never make mistakes. That's not going to be here. Here's what it is. The way that your children are going to save the world or make the world a better place or serve God is if they surrender their will to God. That's what determines how they turn out. Jesus said, Father, if thou be willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. It was surrendering his will in the Garden of Eden that made him save the human race. Now, I understand if he wasn't sinless, he couldn't have been our sacrifice. So he had to be sinless. But it was not his sinlessness that saved us. It was his surrender that saved us. It's not your children's sinlessness that will determine if they accomplish something for God. It's their surrender. Young people. You will serve God and make a success out of your life, not if you're sinless, but if you surrender. It's the surrender that determines whether you're able to serve God. Decision determines destiny. Decision determines destiny. What you decide to do as an adult, just like that bird, little bird, time has come to leave the safety of the nest. You can release that bird, but that bird goes fly away. Your creator made you free to choose your path. But that bird, it's the decisions that that bird makes when it flies away that determines the future of that bird. And it's the same way. Be good parents. Do the best you can. And young people, submit to your parents just like Jesus submitted to his imperfect parents. But you know what? What is going to determine how your life goes is one simple word, surrender. Jesus Christ surrendered his will to the Father and went to the cross. That's how he changed the world. You are not ever going to be sinless. You can't be that part of Jesus Christ. But you know what part of Jesus Christ you can imitate? Surrender. He said, not my will, but thine be done. Decision determines destiny. All of your life, you will be faced over and over again with that decision. Am I going to do my will or God's will? My will or God's will? You will sin. You will fail. 
But the, what will determine how your life turns out is not your sin nature or not sin nature, but whether or not you surrender to your heavenly Father. Decision determines destiny. Let's pray. Father in heaven, I pray that we'll get the message of this sermon, that we'll understand the decisions we make, and that it's not about being sinless, but that it is about being surrendered. Father, I pray we'll surrender our lives completely to you. Thank you that Jesus Christ was sinless, but he was willing to die on the cross for our sins and surrender his will to the Father. Father, I pray that everyone here will say, not my will, but thine be done. If you're here today and you had a bad childhood, you need to know this. Jesus Christ was raised by imperfect parents, but he said, not my will, but thine be done. If you're here today and you are growing up in a home with imperfect parents, I want you to know this. Don't think that your life is going to be determined by your upbringing. Your life is determined by whether or not you say, not my will, but thine be done. Every single person in this room can decide today they're going to surrender completely to God. And then they will over and over again, every time they're faced with a choice between doing what God says and what they want to do, they, their future will be determined by whether or not they say, not my will, but thine be done. Thank you, Father, for this message. In Jesus' name, amen.